Hello, I'm Togan, and welcome back to the second channel video. Today I wanted to answer the fairly big question about currency, which is why all currencies seem to be worth different amounts. And the short answer to that question is very simple. It's because they're entirely different currencies. They have no reason to be linked together. But the long answer to that question is a bit more complex. It's why this video is being made, because most people, if they were to design a world from scratch, you'd have most currencies be worth pretty similar amounts. So why is it that one US dollar is pretty close to one franc, but it's worth over a hundred yen and over a thousand Korean won, why is that the case? And to answer this question, my credibility today is that I am in fact in a room filled with money, as you can see behind me, and uh, in case that's not enough proof, here is a giant slab of gold that I own. As you can see, I am a man with lots of money. There's even money in the reflection of the gold button, it seems. But yeah, I am a man who has lots of money, as it seems. So let's talk about why currencies are worth different amounts with my credentials. So let's start by dispelling a myth, shall we? Because it's often thought that low value currency means a country with inflation issues. There's the joke about the Zimbabwe dollar being worth about a billion US dollars and you have to you know, wheel around 10 billions or trillions off it. And although that was true at one point, it's not necessarily true that a high value currency is a strong currency. If that was the case, that low value meant weak and high value meant strong, then Kuwait would have the best currency in the world and Iran would have one of the worst because one Kuwaiti dinar is worth 138,592.82 Iranian rials. However, that isn't to say that Kuwait's economy is 138,000 times better than Iran's. In fact, Iran's economy as a whole is bigger and better and, you know, minus a lot of sanctioning issues. Uh, you know, Iran does have a strong versatile economy. So why is it that their currency is worth 138,000? thousand times less than that of the Kuwaiti dinner. Why is it worth, you know, multiple tens of thousands times less than your currency? And uh, yeah, it's because these val relative values don't actually represent the stability or the value of the currency as a whole. So if they don't represent those things, then what do they represent? So uh, we have to go a little bit back in time because the history of most currency, uh, you know, like to go through the very basic system of like, well, we went from barter to having gold, to having notes, to having uh, nationwide currencies. And yeah, basically, uh, you know, via that entire system, we ended up having currency, which was always worth something until fairly recently. In the post-world, uh, you know, like world of trying to fix the economy, trying to get the world's economy from going, you know, based on heavily war-based to being, you know, back to actually selling goods and services, which other, uh, one of the changes that was made was that most currencies stopped being fixed against gold. Most currency before that point was always worth a certain amount of gold because if currency wasn't worth a certain amount of gold why would you trust it? What was the point in trusting currency if it was just something a government could print? And obviously in the years since then we've seen why countries like Zimbabwe or Venezuela obviously cannot trust the you know the, the currencies of their government because they were able to print it infinitely. Most countries though have realized like, okay, people will trust us even though we're not backed by gold anymore. Let's be careful of that. So yeah, at one point, money used to be worth a certain amount of gold, but the amount of gold was different by country. The amount, the ease of, uh, you know, turning currency into gold was different by country, and the values of the exchange was always slightly different. So when that gold uh, standard was removed, uh, which again, was slightly different in each country, but in post-World War II terms, to keep things simple, uh, in America, it was about 20 years later, because they were the gold currency. Uh, long story on that one too. But basically, every single currency eventually unlinked itself from gold, and when they unlinked themselves from gold, they became worth different amounts relative to each other. Before this point, every currency was worth something relative to gold. After this point, every currency was worth something relative to each other, and more importantly, relative to the US dollar. Like I said, the US dollar kept on the gold standard, so indirectly for about 20 years, they were worth some amount of US dollars, which gave them some amount of value in gold. And then eventually this was removed, So this meant that pretty much every single currency could freely float against one another. There are some exceptions to this rule with countries that don't allow you to exchange the money outside that country. You've probably heard of a few of those, but most currencies, any currency that you can just freely buy, uh, whether it's Mexican pesos, whether it's Canadian dollars, whether it's your Australian dollars, your Japanese yen, your Hong Kong dollars, you can just take and they're worth a certain amount based on the exchange rate at that time. What is the exchange rate at that time? Well, if say, uh, you know, one Canadian dollar was meant to be worth perfectly one Mexican peso, uh, uh, then if people were willing to make that trade, they would stay at that value. However, if people wanted more Canadian dollars than people wanted Mexican pesos, then what would start to happen is the Mexican peso would devalue relative to the Canadian dollar. And uh, although this is a simplistic uh, you know, explanation with just two currencies, where, oh no, the Mexican peso is worth 0.9 and the Canadian's worth 1.1, uh, the reality is this is happening with every single currency relative to every single other currency on a daily basis. And in reality, uh, the standard that seems to hold is that most currencies are worth some amount of US dollars 
dollars, and then you can trade any other currency based on their relative value to the US dollar. Uh, it still means that every single currency has an exchange rate with every single other currency. The currency of Switzerland and uh, the currency of Angola, they have an exchange rate, despite the fact that there's like 16 dudes a year that are trading uh, via that. Uh, the currency of uh, Malaysia and the currency of Argentina? You know, I'm assuming those countries don't do too much trade. Uh, there is an exchange rate for these two. Every single currency is worth some amount of every single other currency, and uh, this means that lots of currencies have different units, different values, but how did these values get so out of whack that you get to the stage where one Iranian real is worth 138,000 times less than one Kuwaiti dinner? This makes sense to explain like, okay, yeah, the Mexican peso is worth less than the Canadian dollar, but they you know, they, they have some rough value to each other. Why is the, uh, you know, the Iranian real worth so little? Why is the Indonesian rupiah or the Korean won worth so little compared to a US dollar? And there are two explanations to this one. One is the simplistic thing of inflation. Uh, so basically a lot of currencies might have dealt with inflation issues in the past. Uh, Indonesia did have some famous ones post-independence. And this means that, uh, you know, even though Indonesia's inflation as of the current year, it's on screen right now, but it's just over 3%, pretty normal, a little bit high, but not really, you know, like too big of a problem. Uh, it's pretty normal inflation now, but they did uh, had inflation issues in the past, but there are also some currencies that just don't have a unit for a hundred of something. So for instance, uh, the yen uh, doesn't have a unit to define a hundred yen. Instead, you just keep counting yen after that point. Uh, for instance, the, uh, you know, the Russian ruble, it doesn't have a 100 Russian ruble unit, whereas the, you know, Great British Pound or the US dollar, they have cents, they have pennies, they have a subdivision of a unit and uh, yeah this is something that most currencies might have had in the past or just don't have at all and therefore as a result you know 100 yen is worth one dollar in reality this is worth you know one yen is worth one cent but most people just think of it as like wow I go to Japan and I'm so rich I take a few thousand dollars and I've got a million yen that I can have fly away like happens in an episode of The Simpsons so yeah the truth is different currencies are worth different amounts for very different reasons and a lot of people have this big misperception that the only reason Reason that the Indonesian rupiah must be worth so much less than the dollar is because, you know, like, oh, our currency is just that much stronger than theirs. But this isn't actually true. Eventually, whenever, you know, like inflation does happen in the past, when prices do change, prices just adjust. It doesn't matter to the market what each currency is worth, you know, just because there is 10,000, uh, you know, less value per individual unit. It just means that prices are 10,000 times higher. And once everyone's adjusted that so after a certain amount of time uh, to an Indonesian person, it's kind of weird that you go to, uh, you know, the US and everything's uh, measured in just like a few US dollars instead of having to hand over a hundred thousand, uh, you know, no. Because the notes adjust, because the people adjust, because the price expectations adjust, uh, it means that, you know, there isn't this huge thing of people being like, wow, it sure is quirky that houses can cost a billion, uh, you know, Indonesian rupiah or, you know, a billion one or something. The fact that this is possible doesn't mean that, you know, people go crazy and think it's wild. This is just what they're used to. In the same way, you're used to prices in your local area and when you go somewhere else, it feels a bit different. Uh, this price thing can also be defined by the currency. And yeah, uh, the, the fact that over time these values change uh, means that you have different people, current countries with different currencies. The reason they're worth so different amounts is because they have no re reason to be linked together. There was no universal point where we all said, let's have one currency be worth one unit. And then over time, they'll kind of deviate from that. They started at different points. They've gone through wildly different movements, inflation, deflation, increase in demand versus of currencies, decrease in volume versus of currencies. They've had all these changes and people have been used to them for those changes. So the weirder thing is to imagine that the world would start at the same amount each time. It's like asking, why don't we have a universal language? And it's like, well, the reason we don't have a universal language is because we used to have different languages for every like tribe and every small part of the world. The fact that there is even close to a universal second language, you know, English, like I'm speaking in this video, that is an astounding thing. That was a sign of progress. That wasn't something that just happened by default. We didn't one day all speak speak the same language, then decide, you know what, it'd be cool if instead of speaking English, we spoke some, you know, like, uh, you know, we spoke a bit of Indonesian, uh, and there's a lot of languages, Javanese, for instance, it'd be cool if we spoke, uh, you know, a language from there, or a language, Malaysian, that's a wacky language to make up, and although a few languages are constructed, that doesn't mean that they made a language different to your own thing, and it's the same with currency. Not every currency was looking at the US dollar going, hey, why don't we make one of those, but worth 10,000 times less? Every currency developed in, with a very long independent history, 
And when you try to sum them all up together, like you did this, like I've done this video, or like uh, people might do to explain why they're worth so little, you have to make a lot of generalizations, but there's a deep history into anything in the world, and that's a thing worth keeping in mind. So yeah, next time you go to a country where you hear they have a low value currency, like, oh, I'm going to Korea, I'm gonna feel rich. You're going to feel rich. That doesn't mean you're going to be rich. It doesn't mean the people there have suffered a great inflation. Korea does famously, again, post-World War, uh, post-Korean War, have a pretty steady economy. South Korea, I should say. I mean, North Korea, a little bit different situation, but you know, doesn't mean that they've had hyperinflation over there. And also, currencies that have had hyperinflation, uh, the worst type of inflation, I mean, inflation's already uh, kind of questionable. Uh, countries that have the level of inflation that wipes out everyone's savings, everyone's wealth to build the government stream, uh, currencies that do that, they don't necessarily seem super low value. Again, the Zimbabwe dollar is a famous example where, again, the exchange rate of one of those to a dollar before they suspended their currency, because they're not, they, they don't trust themselves to have a currency anymore. They just use the dollar, the euro, and a few other uh, currencies like that. Uh, you know, the, the, the exchange rate between those two is staggering. However, if you look at another country, the one which is currently hyperinflating beyond belief, Venezuela, they re-denominate their currency every so often. They've done it twice in the last 10 years. And because of that, it looks like the exchange rate is pretty darn good, right? But that doesn't mean that Venezuela is a safe place to put your money. I mean, like, I mean, there are some people that might say that it is. I think, you know, universally, unless you're the sort of person who's like, ah, anything that's called socialism or communism is good, regardless of if it kills people or whatever, which there are a few defenders of that on YouTube. If you're one of those people, invest your money in Venezuela. It's a great decision. You'll get really good returns that match your ethics in the world. Uh, but if you're not that sort of person, if you do know what's happening in Venezuela, then you'll know, yeah, don't invest in there. Also, just a little rant because uh, it's something that's very positive, but it's also like one of those long-term trends people don't know because it happens very slowly, but the rate of a Great British Pound to a US dollar has gone significantly down over time. Like, it's always dipping and then, like, just kind of being expected that way. Uh, and to show that example, just after World War II, it was worth around four, uh, you know, like, US dollars to one British Pound. Uh, when I was younger, when I used to do a business on the internet, if you don't know, when I was, like, uh, 10 to 15, uh, I used to, like, sell ads online. It was, it was a thing I did. I always get paid in US dollars because that's the currency of the world, the currency of the internet. And it used to be worth, like, two US dollars to a pound, even like 10 years ago when I was younger. Now, whenever I get paid, because I still get paid in dollars, because it's the currency of the internet, and this video I get paid for, uh, you know, when I get paid today, uh, it's something like 1.3, and that that rate slowly dips over time. Uh, and yeah, at one point, we're gonna end up at like par. People won't think that that's a bad thing, but that's an example of a currency actually weakening over time. Uh, you know, the, the Great British Pound went from like one of the reserve currencies to now, you know, like fourth or fifth or something. And uh, yeah, that's an interesting example of a currency actually falling, whereas the Iranian Rial, again, lots of problems in Iran, but it doesn't mean that Kuwait's currency is better than yours and also the US and also Japan and also China. No, it's very different, very complicated. And maybe we should talk about someday whether there'll be a universal currency. Let me know if you'd like that and the explanation as to the progress we're making towards that, uh, you know, a universal currency in the comments down below. But for now, I've spoken for too long, so I'm gonna say, second channel, don't care. Goodbye.